The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Mark, I am reminded this morning of why some folks put sheets over the communion table. It used to be to keep the flies off of it, but now I'm convinced it's so that the preacher's son doesn't see it and want to have it for the whole service until it's time for him to go. So, Mark chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 9 through 15. <clears throat> in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, as we come before you to hear a word from you, God, we pray that you clear our minds of whatever, whatever stumbling blocks may be in the way. Give us clear ears, Lord, that we may hear your word. Open eyes that we may see you. See you calling us ever on in the work of the kingdom ever deeper into relationship with you. And God, speak to us through these words of Holy Scripture now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, time. I used to think time was a simple thing, uh, really something I took for granted. Like the rest of you, I hope, at least, I learned in school about time, I learned that it's measured in seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc. I learned that 60 seconds makes a minute, 60 minutes make an hour, but 60 hours don't make a day. It throws you off, right? 24 hours make a day, 365 days make a year, but technically it's 365 and a quarter days make a year. We play catch up every fourth year and call it a leap year, you know. Time moves well, time moves at a steady pace. At least it seems that way to us. Galileo called it the flow of time. I mean, the second hand on my watch doesn't move faster or slower from one tick to the next. It just is constant. Newton even measured time that way. And that's how most people understood it until this German physicist in the early 20th century came up with this theory about how time is actually relative, that it's this relative dimension really of this greater fabric called space-time, and that time can be subject to the speed of an object or even to an extreme gravitational field like a black hole. But you all knew that, right? Now don't ask me how all this works. I don't know. Einstein's theory of relativity revolutionized the way we observe and understand the universe. But the thing is, I've heard people talking about how time is relative my whole life. Well, I've heard it from older folks like me who probably can't even spell Einstein, let alone know about his theory of relativity. And I'm pretty sure most of you have too. It's usually when I'm talking to someone with adult kids, maybe grandkids, they see Cole squirming, you know, on the pew up here with me trying to not sit still. And they'll say things like, yeah, yeah, I remember when mine were that little. It goes by fast. Those years always seem to go by faster, they say. But do the younger years of children really pass by quicker than the later years? Or, or what about every December? You all probably hear it, probably say it yourself too, right? Inevitably, someone will say, I swear Christmas comes faster every year. 
But does Christmas arrive faster? Or does it just seem to arrive more frequently as we experience more of them? I don't know. I don't know if time speeds up or slows down really. But I do know that time is a fickle thing. It takes too long to pass when we're waiting on something. It passes too quickly when we're trying to hold on. And it never moves backwards. But what does it mean for time to be fulfilled? What does Jesus mean when he says the time is fulfilled? There's an awful lot that goes on in these six verses in the text we've read this morning. In just five verses before Jesus shows up in the Galilee preaching, the time is fulfilled. For starters, Jesus is baptized by his cousin John in verse 9. In those days, Mark says, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And that's it. We're not told how deep the water was, how cold it was, nothing. Mark doesn't give us the exchange that we find in Matthew's gospel, the whole Jesus coming down and John saying, you come to be baptized by me? Oh, no, no, no. I should be baptizing you. It's not there. We don't get the detailed account of who all is waiting in line like in Luke's gospel. Luke says when all the people were baptized, the rich, the religious, the poor, the soldiers, it's not there. All Mark says is Jesus came and was baptized by John. There's no detailed account. Mark has things to do. Jesus has things to do in Mark's gospel. When the second hand ticks in Mark's gospel, it's with a quick and thunderous reminder that there are things to do, places to go, and people to heal. That's why we move from this little staccato story of baptism directly to the proclamation from God in verses 10 and 11. Just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, the spirit descending like a dove, and a voice from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The sky literally schizo, it rips open, the spirit of God descends, and Jesus hears the voice of God affirm his sonship. And you might think, you might think that we'd stay in this place for a while. Maybe savor this miraculous moment. But no. It's almost like Jesus' hair is still wet from the Jordan when he's driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. And he's there for 40 days. A nice round Bible number. Tempted by Satan. With the wild beasts and angels wait on him. Mark doesn't have the detailed description of this exchange between Jesus and Satan in the wilderness. No remarks about turning stone to bread. No no being shown the kingdoms of the world. No jumping off of temples like in Matthew and Luke's account. There's nothing. Just nothing. Mark does not have that kind of time. We got to get moving. So Jesus has endured his temptation with Satan, survived the wilderness with all of its wild beasts, had angels wait on him. But before he can mount sort of his comeback narrative, before the Rocky music can play as he walks slowly out of the wilderness, before he has a chance to have a renewed sense of mission and a steadfast determination to do what God has called him to do, he gets the bad news about his cousin. John was arrested. His cousin, his forerunner, the one who cleared the way, setting the example, going ahead of him, has been arrested. And this isn't, this isn't just a little slap on the wrist. He's not going to spend a night or two in jail. There's no fine to pay, no parole hearing. This is the end of his life. John has been arrested. And it's only in the wake of that news, only in the wake of the news of John's arrest, that Mark says, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Straight to work. No time to visit John in the slammer. No time to take John's one phone call. No time to figure out when his court date is to drop by. Nothing. The proclamation of God's good news. That's the priority for Jesus. And it's the nature of that message that catches my attention this morning on the first Sunday in Lent. 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The time is fulfilled. All of that rushing, all of that hurrying through baptism, divine declaration, temptation and arrest, and now the time is fulfilled. Now, now I'm not saying Mark got it wrong. I'm not saying Jesus did it the wrong way, but if it had been me, if it had been me deciding when the time was fulfilled, it would have been in that single glorious moment when the heavens ripped open and the Spirit descended in the voice of God. That's, that's when I would have tapped on the glass with my fork and knife, getting everybody's attention, clapping my hands, waving my arms. Hey, listen up! The time is fulfilled! The sky ripped open. A spirit came down. It's now. That's when I would have do it. That's the time to do it. When the very universe, the cosmos, is responding to the arrival of God's Son. Not after all that other stuff. Especially not after temptation. Not after some mention of the devil. Not after wild beasts and their snarling snouts. Not after the arrest of my prophetic hype man of a cousin. But I suppose, I suppose that's the reality of time. At least the reality of God's time. That the fulfilled time of God's kingdom doesn't wait for the roses to bloom. It doesn't spring up when things are going well or when the theatrics of the moment demand it. The fulfilled time of God's kingdom Well, it's our time. It's our time. Happening in the midst of the ups and downs of life, in the divine declarations and the satanic temptations. The fulfilled time of God's kingdom, well, Jesus says it, is now. And that's the thing. God's time is fulfilled even now. Right here, while you're sitting in this room, right now. Let that sink in for a minute. When you're waiting on God, as folks say, when you're trying to hold on to that fleeting feeling of the closeness to Christ that comes in those those rare moments in life when you just say, oh, I'm so close to God, I wish I could just sit here and hold on to it. When you're wondering, is this all going to work out in God's time? Remember, God's time has been fulfilled. Jesus proclaimed the time of fulfillment of God's kingdom, not in the midst of that glorious moment, but after the transformative experience of his baptism, after the sky was torn apart in this moment of the Spirit's transcendence, and after being driven by that same Spirit into the wilderness to deal with the devils that waited for him there, after the terrible news of his cousin's arrest, the fulfillment of God's kingdom, of God's time, is after all of this. And that means it includes all of this. Jesus didn't push pause when he went in the wilderness. All right, God's time is fulfilled, but let me deal with the devil's time for a little bit. No. He didn't cut out the part about John's arrest. Well, the time is fulfilled, except for that business with John. We'll deal with that later. No. Nor did he elevate his experience in the Jordan. He didn't say, the time is fulfilled. And what I mean by that is that time over yonder in the river when this happened. No, he doesn't say that. It's all part, all part of the ups and downs. The divine, the devious, the good news of liberation, the heartbreaking news a trial and arrest. It's all part of God's fulfilled time. Now I suppose, I suppose I, from here I could slip easily into the sort of glib inclinations of some of my friends who say, well, you know, God is in control. God has a plan or things all work out in God's time. I mean, those are maybe true, somewhat easy, comforting notions To believe that bad things happen to us and and when they do and good things happen when they do because God has somehow already laid out every detail, every moment of our lives, right down to what cereal you ate this morning. 
But that's not what I'm getting at. That's not what I mean. No, what I'm trying to tell you is that all of time, whether you measure it by the passing hands of a clock or by Einstein's equations, all of time belongs to God. And God's kingdom finds its fullness, its fulfillment in that time. Each and every second, every minute, every hour, every moment is pregnant with the possibility of God's presence. I believe that's why Jesus said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is close. Or as he says in John's gospel, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is close among us at hand, a second away. And every once in a while, every once in a while, it's so close that it slips in on us. It taps us on the shoulder and gives us a wink if we're looking for it. It can slip in unnoticed like the way a, a baby smiles at a stranger across the restaurant. It can sneak in quietly, breaking through the chaos and confusion of life like the way a sunset on the drive home from an awful day at work will sometimes stop us and remind us that there's something besides us, something bigger than us. But most of the time, though, I'm convinced that the kingdom of God is so close that the very fabric, perhaps, of space-time, that it passes unnoticed, lost in the familiar, unseen in the mundane, hidden in plain sight, just beyond our consciousness as we're distracted by all those things in our lives that we think are important. But it's there. The kingdom of God is there. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is close at hand. And all we have to do is reach out for it. All we have to do is stop and look for it. All we have to do is look. It may be right beside us in the aching heart and troubled soul of our neighbor. It may be right behind us in the stranger we've passed, walking down the road, trying not to make eye contact, but that sudden feeling in our gut tells us maybe, maybe I should turn around. It may be right in front of us in the work we do every day, the work we sometimes cuss because it's repetitive, hard, and the pay is terrible. It may be right in front of us in the time we spend in the people who surround us and the opportunities we have and the ones we must work for. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And it may be found true in the grand mystical experiences that click by ever so often in our lives. Or it may be found far more often in the simple, less obvious things. Like, I don't know. The person sitting beside you handing you a tray of bread, a tray of juice. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe you'll see the kingdom of God today. Maybe it'll sneak in on you and you'll catch a glimpse. After all, the kingdom of God is at hand. And we're all living on fulfilled time. God's fulfilled time. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, be with us now, O God, as we are served from your table. May we see a glimpse of your fulfilled kingdom and its time as we take this bread and this cup. And may you speak to us in these powerful gifts that you give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.